Good morning. Everyone good? Awesome. Well, it's exciting to be with you. Today, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to open up God's Word. I thank Pastor for trusting me and Valleydale for trusting me to be able to do this. So, to be with you today, to open up God's Word. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Um, today is Ghost Sunday. We've already said that. I'll say it again. Um, today is one of the things we started doing a couple of years ago was uh, making this a day, again, an- another emphasis uh, emissions in the fall, but also a day where we really uh, are excited to release our next year's short-term trips. And so hopefully you've been by the booth. You can't miss it out there. Um, And uh, hopefully you've been there. If you haven't, I would encourage you to go by there after the service. Uh, But you can go by there, get one of these. This is our list of our 25 trips. What we'd encourage you to do is to take this home with you, put it in your Bible, uh, you know, put it around your, your table, your dinner table, pray about it as a family and see if the Lord you know, hopefully is wanting you to go, you and your family on a trip this year. So please stop by and get that. Another thing real quick is uh, just want to remind you of our uh, local event this Friday. Uh, it's going to be a great night. We're going to get here, have a lot of local partners here. We'll get to hear from some of them, uh, celebrate with them, but also give you an opportunity uh, to be able to visit with them. And hopefully you get, you know, connected to some of those ministries. Uh, we'll have food. We'll have activity for the kids. And so it'd be a real family event. So we'd love for you to come. If you go to the events page, you can sign up right there. It'll be great to know so that we can make sure we have enough food uh, for that night. So that's Friday from 5 to 7 uh, right here uh, in the worship center and in the gyms. So if you have your Bibles, go with me. You already know this, but uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to be in verses 20 through 40. Uh, You know, one of the things that uh, really, you know, not a surprising to me, it shouldn't be surprising to you, we love battles, Like, don't we just love battles? Like, we love watching battles. We love good and evil coming together. We just love battles. Think about movies. All kind of movies today are centered around good and evil that come to a battle at one point in some way. Uh, If you don't believe me, think about yesterday. All across the world, stadiums filled up. Some of you may have been at some of the games to watch a battle. We love battles. But the truth of the Christian life, it is a battle. Whether you believe that or not, the Christian life is a battle. It's a war. Um, If we're going to engage the world with the gospel, it will be a battle. 2 Corinthians 4.4 says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. As we engage the world, the devil is not going to go down without a fight. We are in a battle. But here's the good news, church, or there is good news that we can be encouraged. And that's my prayer for this morning is that we leave here encouraged as we face this great battle. Today, we're going to look at a battle that we see in the Bible. We're going to see this battle between the prophet Elijah and the prophet's of Baal. And as we look at this battle this morning, uh, I want us to see, I believe we see two very important things that when it comes to engaging the world, as we look at the story, one, the first one is that we can learn why we must engage the world. Like, why do we go? Why do we do what we do? Uh, why do we go and fulfill the great commission and do all we do here at the church's missions? Well, the reason is not only is it a command from God, but there's also a world out there who is worshiping false gods who will never save them, never bring them true hope and happiness and joy, and will only lead them to death and destruction. The world is on a pathway to a Christless eternity in hell, um, and we have a message of hope and salvation. That is why we go. The second thing that we can learn is how do we engage the world? Maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, I know we need to do this. I know we need to engage the world, but how do we do it? How do we get into this battle? And if that's you, then I thank you for asking that question. That's what we're gonna look at today is how we, by looking at what Elijah does, I believe we can see exactly how we are to engage this culture. Uh, Before we dive into this story, I want to give you a little background, a little context, what is going on. During this time, 
because of their sin and rebellion, Israel, the nation of Israel, had split into two kingdoms, the north and the south kingdom. And what we see through the books of Kings and Chronicles, we see these kingdoms not only split, but we see these many kings that would come and go throughout these two uh, books of the Bible. In 1 Kings 16, we see a man named Ahab become the king of Israel. Verse uh, 1630 in 1 Kings says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were for him. This Ahab was an evil king. One of the things that we see him do is he built an altar to Baal. God, see, would eventually bring this prophet Elijah to confront this evil king, uh, which would eventually set up what we see is this great battle. In 1 Kings 18, uh, Elijah goes and he confronts Ahab. In verse 19, which is going to set up the story, it says this, Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. The, the battle is now set. Look at verse 20. So Ahab sent all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Now, there's three groups in this story. Uh, we know Elijah. That's, that's an easy one. We know the prophets of Baal. Uh, but the third group is Israel. Israel uh, is in this story. As Ahab goes and he gathers the people of Israel and the prophets of Baal. But notice again where they're at, Mount Carmel. Now, what is so significant about Mount Carmel? Carmel. Well, Mount Carmel was believed to be the turf of the false god Baal. Basically, this battle would be fought on enemy territory. See, God was giving them all the home field advantage. You think about home field, think about sports. You want home field advantage, right? Why? Because you have the advantage, right? You have the crowd. It's loud. Your fans are there. So not only was God sending Elijah into this big battle, but he was sending him in to enemy territory territory. His military would say he's going behind enemy lines. Not only was Baal, not only was this his territory, but he was also the god of the sun and god of the storm. So bringing down fire should have not been a problem for Baal. Basically what we see is God is giving every advantage to Baal and his prophets. God did not want to give them any excuse. Now think about this. When our teams lose, on a Saturday or a Friday night, what do we do? We make a lot of excuses, right? Well, this happened or this happened, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? That's what we do, right? God is basically eliminating any excuse by Baal. Verse, look at verse 21. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer. See, what I think is going on in this story is Israel is trying to follow both Baal and God at the same time. I think this is the, most, the main point of the story is God, through Elijah, is showing Israel, his people, that he is the one and only true God. He is the only one that can save them. He is the only one who deserves their worship. See, this is why we ultimately go to our community and go around the world with the gospel because God deserves the worship of the nations. Uh, one of my favorite missions book is called Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper. And he says this in the very beginning of the book, missions exist because worship does not. Now that's powerful, right? Missions exist because worship does not. What Piper is saying, what we should understand is the reason why we go is because Jesus deserves the nations to worship him and we are to go so they can know God and they can worship Jesus as he deserves. See, Elijah says to them, why are you bouncing back and forth? You got to stop that. You have to pick one. If the true God is the one, then follow him. If Baal is the true God, then follow him. You have to pick one. Listen to what Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either they will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. See, the truth is we cannot serve two masters. We cannot worship two masters. Jesus tells us that he is the only one that deserves our worship. He is the only one that can truly save us, satisfy us, lead us to joy, lead us to flourishing. 
All other false gods all over the world, whoever they are, will only lead us to death and destruction. See, in this story, we see them worshiping Baal. But today, what we seem to have a tendency to worship is other false gods. Money, power, sex, drugs, alcohol, careers, family, uh, religion, many other things uh, that we can worship um, instead of God. See, a false god, the definition that I'm saying is anything that we seek other than God for salvation and hope and satisfaction. That is a false god. Martin Luther, the great theologian, said this, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that really is your God. But the truth is we are worshiping beings. God created us to worship him, but sin has caused us to worship other things. We will worship God, the true God, or we will worship something else. Ultimately, we will worship rather God or we will ultimately worship ourselves. Uh, Listen to what Matthew Roberts says. Uh, He says this, the autonomous self is worshiped above all other things. My individual freedom is the value that trumps all others. Christians too easily absorb this same attitude, yet it is utterly foolish and wicked. Myself is no more an unconquerable deity than Baal or Zeus or Artemis of the Ephesians, no more able to help me and no more worthy of worship. So we're living in a culture today that says the way that you find happiness, the way that you flourish and the way that you have joy is to trust yourself, live for yourself, worship yourself basically. Do whatever makes you happy and do not let anyone tell you anything differently. It's about you and what makes you happy. But the truth is worshiping anything other than God will never save us will never lead to life of flourishing, nor joy, nor happiness. Only Jesus can give us these things. Look at verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only am left a prophet of the Lord, but prophets, bells, are 450 men. What Elijah is thinking here is, I'm the only one here that's worshiping the true God. Uh, This bell, he's got plenty of people worshiping him. I am the only one. Again, he's challenging Israel here. You cannot serve two masters. You have to pick one. Verse 23, let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. So he's setting up the battle here. Uh, he's, he, again, what we're going to see over and over and over is the purpose of this battle is for Elijah to show Israel, to show these prophets that their God does not exist. So he's going to set up the battle. He's going to say, we're going to take these bulls, we're going to split them up, and we're going to build an altar. And the real God is the one who will show up. Now, before we go on, one of the things that you notice as you read this story is you see this sarcastic attitude of Elijah, almost like it comes across as arrogance, Um, and he kind of taunts them. Now, I believe there is some taunting there, but I don't believe it's so much arrogance as it is confidence. See, Elijah is confident, not in himself, but he's confident in God. There's There's a different meaning there. He is not in himself, but in God. See, he knows that Baal is a false god. He knows that Baal has no power and can do nothing. He was confident in God. See, we see the same thing with David. Remember the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17? You know, Goliath is there. He's taunting Israel, Saul, and all of his people. They're just terrified. This little David shows up, and he's like, what are you all scared about? That guy? That's who you're scared about? Why don't you fight him? And he says, you know what? I'll go do it. Now, where was David's confidence? It was not in himself. His confidence in God. He said, look, God has protected me when all these animals attacked me. God took care of them for me, and God will do the same thing with this giant. See, again, he's not confident in himself. He was confident in God, and we see the same thing here with Elijah. See, as we seek to live out the Christian life and engage the community and the world with the gospel, we must have this same confidence not in ourselves but in God now I'm not suggesting that we taunt the world maybe exactly how Elijah does in the story but I do think we need his confidence again in God 
See, no matter what happens in this world, God is in control. He's more powerful than anything in the world. So we can be confident that God will be with us and he will be on our side and he will lead us to victory. Now, this does not mean that we will not suffer. This, we will suffer, we will be persecuted, we will be hated. But no matter what happens, we can trust God that he's in control and he will lead us to victory. Why? Because he is victorious. Listen to what Jesus tells us in John 16, 33. I've said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. I love this, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, I got this. Trust me. Verse 24. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. See, what Elijah says is that we're going to set these altars, we're going to build these altars, and we're both going to call out to our God, and the one who shows up is the true God. He sets this up. Again, he is confident. He knows what's about to happen. Verse 25, then Elijah said to the prophet of Baal, choose for yourself one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. See, what Elijah is saying, there is no need for a coin toss here. He says, I'm going to let you go first. So he's setting them up. He knows exactly what's about to happen. He's about to let them in for a rude awakening. So he says, you go ahead and go. You build your offer and you call out to your God because he knows what's going to happen. He knows that their God is not and cannot do anything for them. Their God does not exist. As we engage the world, we must help them understand the truth. We must be like Elijah and reveal to them that their God is false. And he can't do anything. Only God, the God of the Bible, is the true God who can save us. Verse 26. And they took the bull that was given them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. I mean, just, just put yourself in this story of these prophets they're desperate, right? They are, they are calling out, Baal, please come. Come, show us that you love us. Show us that you are real and that you have power. Like they're calling to him and the whole time they're calling, you know what happens? Nothing. No matter how much they called, their God never comes. Listen to what Psalms uh, 115, two through seven says. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. And he does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. You see what the psalmist is saying? These false gods, they can't do anything. They cannot do anything. They don't exist. They have no power. You see, he knows that, that Baal is not coming. No matter how much they call out, he knows that this God is never coming, cannot do anything because Baal is a false God that cannot do anything. The only thing that false gods can do is lead us to death and instruct, to instruction and to enslave us. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the Tolkien series, Lord of the Rings. But if you have, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, that's okay. This whole series is centered around a powerful ring. And in this ring, anyone who possesses it has great power. But the ring is evil. It enslaves its owner. It, it slowly destroys them. This ring is evil. And no matter how much people want to get away from it, they can't. They continue and continue to desire it. See, the truth is, this is like every false god. They're evil. They slowly destroy you. And no matter how much you want to get away from it and be freed from it, you can't. You desire it. You continue to desire it. In this story, in this movie series, this hobbit named Frodo, he's leading this group of people. And they're going to the fire at Mount Doom to throw this ring, to destroy it in the fire. As they're making their way, and it takes them like four movies to get there. As they're making their way there, uh, Gollum, he's one of the characters in this. He had the ring at one point. It slowly almost destroyed him, enslaved him. 
And he continued to desire it, even as, as evil as it was. And the whole time he's chasing them. And we come to the very end. If you haven't seen this, I'm sorry, spoiler alert. They get to the very end. They're getting ready to throw the ring in the fire. Gollum attacks Frodo and he accidentally falls into the fire. See what the ring caused him? His death and his destruction. This is what false, false gods do. Look at verse 27. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and he must be awakened. This is one of my favorite parts, I think, of it. Um, I, this is what part I wanted Kirkwood to actually read for you, not the other one. But, okay, he didn't want to do that. Uh, but I love this part because we see what Elijah, he's really taunting them here. He's saying, look, if your God is real, he will show up. Why is he not here? I don't know. There's probably a reason why. He may be resting. He may have went on some journey somewhere and he's not made it back yet. Maybe, just maybe his alarm clock didn't go off or just maybe he's on the toilet. Maybe he's using the bathroom right now. We'll just wait on him because he's saying, if your God is real, he will show up. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I read this story, you know what I think about? The Jeopardy theme music. Do, 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 do. You know, like he, why he's waiting on this God to show up. Elijah's given this God all the time in the world to show up. And guess what? Nothing. Nothing happens. Verse 28. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after there was custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out. You see these people, they're desperate. They're cutting themselves. They're chanting. They're, limp. they're doing all that they can do for their God to show up. This was custom for them to to cut themselves, to appease their God. And here's the truth about false gods. If you strip every one of them down, no matter if it's Islam or Hindu or Buddhism or materialism or sex, drugs, money, power, career, no matter what that false god is, if you strip that false god down, you know what it comes down to? One word, appeasement. False gods desire you to do things to appease them. They require more and more of you to the point that you become slaves to them. I was talking to our North Africa partner when they were here. You remember meeting them probably. Uh, and he was telling us about him engaging with this Muslim man. And this Muslim man told him that his God, he believes, does not want him to be happy. His God does not want him to have hope. His God only wants him to be a slave. Now, how sad is that how miserable does that sound but here's the good news what the bible says the bible says that true salvation true hope true joy true freedom can only come from jesus listen to what jesus says in matthew 11 28 through 30 he says come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest Take my yoke upon you and learn, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what Jesus is saying here? Jesus is saying this, if you want true rest and you want true hope and peace and joy, come to me, trust me, let me do the work for you. See, false gods say do. You know what Jesus says? It has been done. Look at verse 29. As midday passed, the rave, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Again, these, God, these uh, prophets, they're continuing to chant and to call and plead with their God to come. Please come, show us that you exist. And the whole time, nothing. Complete silence or silence. They needed their God, but their God never showed up. The truth again is when you call out to a false God, any false God, no matter who it is or what it is, they will never come. They have no power. They don't exist. But the Bible promises us over and over and over that if you true, call out to the true God, the God of the Bible, he will answer you. And he will save you. Listen, I love what Romans 10, 13 says. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts 2, 21. And it shall come to pass that what? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what everyone means? Everyone. 
This is what the Bible tells us. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you truly call out to God, the true God of the Bible, he promises you he will answer you and he will save you. That's the good news of the Bible. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. So see, the prophets of Baal had their turn. Now it's Elijah's turn. He's about to show them what a true God does. Look at verses 31 through 35. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as it would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces. And he laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. He said, do it a second time. And they did a second. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar, around the altar, and filled the trench also with water, with water. See, Elijah, he sets up the altar here. Uh, He takes these 12 stones, he makes a trench, he takes the wood and he cuts the bull into pieces and he lays it on the wood. Now watch what he does. He has the people here, they they take these, these, uh, they fill these water, these uh, things with uh, pitchers, whatever, with water. They fill, fill these jars with water and they pour them on the altar. But notice that he calls it in here in scripture, a burnt offering. This is, a, this is a reference to atonement. You see what's going on here? As these people were pouring out their water on the sacrifice, this was symbolizing people or them laying their sins on the altar to be atoned for. You know what this is a picture of? The gospel. This is what he's showing us. He's showing us the gospel. See, we're all sinners in need of God to save us. Uh, Because of his love and his mercy, he sent his son Jesus to come and pay the price as the ultimate sacrifice to take our sins to the cross and pay the penalty for our sins to take the wrath of God for us so that we can save, forgiven, and reconciled back to God. See, like, like these people, we laid and poured our sins out onto Jesus, and he took our sins to the cross and he paid the sacrifice for us that we deserve. He died the death that we deserve. He took the wrath of God for us. Listen to what Isaiah 53, five and six says, but he was pierced for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on them the iniquity of us all. See what Jesus did for us. This is a picture of the gospel of what Jesus done. But it also is a picture of the gospel because these people did nothing for their salvation. All they did was lay, pour this water. All they did was lay their sins on the altar. And God is the one who brought the fire and ultimately the atonement. See, the truth is we can never do anything to earn our salvation. We can never do anything to repay back God. For our salvation. Ephesians 2 8 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Watch this, not a result of works, so that no one boasts. The Bible tells us that we can do nothing for our salvation. Only Jesus can do it. Verses 36 and 30 37. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Just like the prophets of Baal, they called out to their God and their God never showed up. What happens? Elijah now, after he builds the altar, he now calls out to the true God to say, show us who you truly are. Again, remember, they called their God, their God did nothing, and now Elijah calls his God. Again, the purpose of this whole thing is to show them who the real God is. So look at verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. See, the fire came down. God showed up. And again, this was nothing that Elijah did. He he did his part, But this was all God. God is the one who brought the fire. Verse 39. 
And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. You know, when we experience the true beauty of the gospel, this is how we should respond. We should respond with awe and worship. That's what we see them do here. We should respond the same way. And look at verse 40. This is probably the saddest verse of this whole story. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. See, in this verse, I think we see the ultimate destiny of those who follow a false god. Ultimately, they will receive the wrath and the judgment of God. Church, this is why we go. This is why we take the gospel to our community and to the nations. This is why we have millions of dollars or million dollars in our missions budget. This is why we send short-term teams. This is why we have Go Sunday where we release our trips. This is why we send people out for serve day. This is why we want to raise up people to equip them and send them out with the gospel. This is why we do what we do because the world is looking for hope and peace and happiness but the world is looking for it in the wrong place the world is seeking after false gods who can never save them or bring them joy or hope or peace the world is looking for a false god or false gods who will only lead them to death and destruction and ultimately the wrath of god in eternity in hell this is the where the world is going and we have what they're looking for. We have the hope of the gospel. We have the, who it is and what they're looking for, which is Jesus. The good news of the gospel. Uh, I love what Martin Luther says. I've already quoted him, but I'll quote him again. I love what he says here. He says, on his death, they believe on his deathbed, he said something on the lines of this, that we are all bread beggars. We're all people that need bread, helping others know where to find bread. We are to show the world where they can find what they're looking for. And his name is Jesus. So as we close, I'm going to give you four applications this morning. Uh, really, if you could take away anything, this is what I would say take away from. Here's your application points. Here's the first one. As we engage the culture, we must do our part. We must do our part. As you read this story, Elijah did what he was supposed to do. He came, he gathered the, 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 the Israel, he gathered the false prophets, he gathered all the, the atonement or the sacrifice and all that. He gathered all that, he brought all this together and that's all he was supposed to do and that's what we see him do. A pastor said this, that only God can send the fire but Elijah still had to build the altar. We see Elijah do exactly what God had called Elijah to do and when we think about engaging the world, we're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. God has given us what we're supposed to do. He's given us a command, which is the Great Commission. We are to be obedient. We are to go and make disciples of all nations. And the thing we need to understand is when God gave us this, this was not a suggestion. This was a command. Jesus didn't say to his disciples and us, hey, you know, if you guys got time to do this, that'd be great. You know, or hey, if you can find a little time here, carve a little time out, that'd be great. No, he didn't sue that. He didn't say that. He, this was a command and ultimately this was their priority Christians this should be our priority our priority is to should be to go and take the gospel to a lost and dying world this is our mission we must be obedient uh, God has given us all that we need he's given us his presence and his power uh, through the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us and empowers us to go and be able to do what God has called us to do but ultimately we must be obedient in the book tactics it's a really good book this is what the author says he calls this the 100% God and 100% man he says this I am wholly responsible for my side of the ledger and God is entirely responsible for his I focus on being faithful but tr I trust God to be effective some will respond and some will not the results are his concern not mine we must be obedient here's the second one as we engage the culture, we must rely on God. You think about it, Elijah did what Elijah was supposed to do. He brought everything, he, he got the battle ready and got it all set up, he built the altar. Elijah did everything he did, but then he ultimately depended on God. He depended on God first to be with him. Uh, to, they could depend on God. As we engage the world, we must trust God. We must depend on him. 
And we must know that he will be with us. It will not be easy, but we can trust that God will be with us and he will lead and guide us and equip us to do what he's called us to do. We can trust him in that. And the second thing that Elijah did was he could bring all the elements, which he did, and prepare the sacrifice, which he did, but he depended on God to do what? Bring the fire. As we engage the world with the gospel, we must depend on God. Our role is to be obedient and do what God has called us to do. Our, uh, God, our role is to share the gospel, but it's God's job to, to uh, convict hearts and to draw people to himself. So that's one of the things I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can put ourselves in the wrong role here. We can sometimes get in our minds that if we don't say the right thing or we don't say the gospel presentation the exact right way, if we're not perfect in it, then, the, then God cannot work and people won't be saved. The moment that we think that way, we, don't put enough, we put too much credit in ourselves and we don't put enough credit into God. Our job is to be obedient and, and to do what God has called us to do. And it's God's job to save people. Here's the third one. As we engage the culture, we must expose their false gods. Uh, you ever, I know you probably, some of you may have seen this. There may be some here who have not. But one of my favorite shows growing up was The Wizard of Oz. If you've ever seen that, you know what I'm talking about. Where they go to, at the very end of that, again, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. At the very end of that, they go to Emerald City. Uh, they're going to they're gonna go to the wizard who they think is going to be able to get them home. And this wizard in their mind is very powerful. They get there, they're terrified because all they see is this voice, this deep voice and fire and they're terrified until what happens? Toto, the little dog, he goes behind the curtain and he exposes what? This was just a little man, right? He had no power. He, he, had, he could do nothing for them. That's exactly what Elijah does in this story. Elijah uh, pulls back the curtain and he exposes this false god, Baal, who is a fraud, who has no power, and can do nothing. Uh, he was revealing to them that their God can never save them or bring them hope or peace. Only the true God can do this. See, the world again is looking for truth, hope, peace, and satisfaction, but it's looking for it in the wrong place. The world is seeking these false gods who can never save them, satisfy them, bring them hope or peace, but only can lead to their death and destruction. Blaise Pascal, he was a, a, a philosopher uh, years ago, and he says this, We hunt for happiness, but find only misery and death. We cannot stop wishing for truth and happiness, and yet are incapable of finding either. This is what Elijah was doing. Philip Ryken says that Elijah had to disprove Baal before he could prove God. He had to show that no other God can stand in the ring with the God of Israel. See, as we engage the world, we must first ex understand their worldview. We must understand what they believe about God, what they believe about this world. And once we understand that we must challenge their belief, we must debunk their belief. Sam Chan says this, when engaged in the culture, we must enter their storyline to understand what they believe. This is what Paul did in Athens in Acts 17. Once we enter their storyline, then we must challenge it. And the fourth one is this. As we engage the culture, we must point them to Jesus. Sam Chan again says this. Once we enter their storyline, challenge their storyline, then we must complete it with the gospel. Again, that's what we see Elijah do. He exposed their false God and he came behind it showing them the truth of the real God. That's what he was doing. He was pointing them all, the whole time pointing them to the truth of the gospel. We also see Jesus do this. Jesus' engagement with the woman at the well, if you've read that story, you know what I'm talking about. He comes to this lady to get water, and he tells her this, this water that you're drinking, now he's talking about worldly things, talking about false gods in this woman's life. These things that you're seeking will never quench your thirst. But the water that I give you, the living water, will quench your thirst. That's what Jesus does. As we engage the culture, we must only challenge their belief in their worldview, but we must point them to the truth of the gospel. We must reveal that their God is not, it can, is, doesn't exist, it cannot do anything. Their God can only lead them to death and destruction. See, the world is drinking water that will never quench them. But Jesus is the only one that can quench their thirst. Jesus is the only one that can give them what they're looking for. We have the hope in the gospel, and we must take it to a world that's lost and dying. As we conclude, the truth is, church, is God could have used anything 
he wanted to to get the Great Commission. He could have sprayed it in the sky. He could have wrote out John 3.16. He could have shouted it from the heavens. But his sovereignty and his love for his people, he has chosen to use you and me to work through, to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. And we must be obedient. We must trust him. We must depend on him. And we must go. In the book, How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy, the author says this, we must play our part in evangelism. The gospel belongs to God, but he chooses to use us to tell it in our natural and mundane human words, using our own personal relationships, listening skills, personalities, experiences, stories, emotions, and gospel outlines. So I'm going to leave you with some questions this morning. Are we doing our part? Are you doing your part for the Great Commission? Are you going into your communities in the nation with the hope of the gospel? Are you trusting and depending on the Lord as you engage the world with the gospel? Are you allowing the Spirit to lead and guide you and empower you? Are you investing in others and making disciples? Ultimately, church, we have to ask ourselves, are we being obedient and doing what God is calling us to do and trusting in Him? Let's stand and pray about it this morning.